Hi, I'm Jason Bellamy coming to you from Next 2019 in Chicago, and I'm joined by Beth Fisher, who just finished delivering the John H.P. Maley Lecture. Congratulations. Thank you so much. So it's a lot of work that goes up to this, and you talk about a lot of work that you've done in your past career. Um, you had themes of basically compensation and movement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to boil a very long lecture down into a few minutes, which is what we're going to try to do, you basically talked about the risks of compensation. So just highlight for me that just at the highest level what that risk is. It's just that um, as a profession, we focused on impairments from a stroke, from an ACL injury. We've, we focused on impairments of the side injured. And we haven't even factored into the picture that it's human nature to get the job done in some way. So people figure out how to get the job done. They compensate, and that's what we need to be paying attention to, at least in addition to the other things. Because a lot of the movement abnormalities actually stem from the choices people make. Right, and, and you, you could feel the sense of this sort of snowball effect, right? So I have a problem first, I compensate for it, and now because I've compensated, I'm getting the job done, yeah. but I'm not actually improving or addressing the overall Correct. problem. Correct. Correct. Um, so you had a lot of great visual references. One of my favorite slides, you, you had uh, sort of a collage of people who are walking <laughs> with their canes out to the side, and you mentioned no PT tells them to do this, but they right. do it anyway. Right. So t give me the other examples of things like that that you see where people compensate right there in plain sight. Well, a big one, and I had like, you know, a, a huge list of, of articles that had been published, but a big one is um, in sit to stand. Mm -hmm. So when people come up into standing, they're just putting weight on their non-injured, non-surgical, non-lesion side. It's just, again, human nature. Yeah. And so I don't care how much you strengthen a leg. If I'm gonna keep using the side that works or you know that, that wasn't injured, then it doesn't, matter really and so in a, in a way all that stuff that that physical therapists or other movement related professions can do it doesn't mean anything if they're not moving differently and that's why I feel like the physical therapist needs to focus on getting people to move differently and and um, and helping discover that they have capability helping them discover they have these capabilities so helping them discover those capabilities and also you, you said something pretty powerful. You said at some point you realized that sometimes you're reaching your limitations and not your patient's limitations. Oh, yeah. Tell me what that means to you. All the time. Um, when, I was, when I was at Rancho, I would just, I would hit endpoints with patients as far as their potential to recover. Um, but what I knew was that it was just that I didn't know what more I could do to help access that potential, but I knew it was there. I could, I could see it, I could experience, but I couldn't help people access it. And, and, and actually, you know, that was part of my reason for, all right, I'm going back to school and I'm gonna get a PhD and I'm gonna learn everything there is to know about the brain, and then I'm gonna figure out how to best intervene with patients and access all this potential for brain plasticity. And yeah, no, that, I mean, all I learned about was how complicated the brain is, but um, it, it's, it's really that. It's just realizing that there's so much more. And, um, you know, I made the, the comment that, you know, I, I imagined a lot of people were just like, right, so if you just deal with the compensation, people are gonna fully recover. And of course that's not the case, but I have a video of a patient that has just, this very um, contracted arm. I mean, he's just, it's just really, really severely involved. And he's trying to reach for a, a tube of toothpaste. And his arm is, I mean, it's just really, really severely involved. At one point, just one little clip of the video, his hand opens up. See, I see something like that and I'm like, what? <laughs> what yeah. is that? Yeah. Where's the, you know, and so I, there's something there. And that's what I feel like, that's what our job is, to go after that. Um, you had a powerful example in your video, a guy sitting at the edge of his bed and he's been moving his leg by reaching down to it with his hand and, and yeah. moving it. And you challenge him to not do that and he realizes he can do it himself and he says, he was doing it the other way of course because it's easier, it's easier yeah. to use yeah. his hand. Sure. But then he also says he didn't even realize he could do it himself. 
Um, so when you see things like that, um, the other thing you talked about, so sometimes it's easier, but this gets back to the brain. Sometimes it's fear. So sometimes it's, yeah. I don't want to do something because I feel more unstable or maybe I'm worried it's going to hurt. How do you work with patients to get them beyond the fear? You mentioned if you can get them to try something different, it's a starting point. And now you got to get them to be confident enough to build it into their life. That's, How do you do that? It's an excellent point because I feel like that's, you know, and I kept saying that's where therapy should begin once I've discovered that. But it doesn't take, it doesn't take me to give someone a cane and maybe even a brace and have them just hop around and figure out how to move from A to B on their own. They can do that. But the time they spend with me should be about dealing with that instability. And, and you know, I'm not going to let anything catastrophic happen, mm -hmm. but they should feel unstable right. with me because that's what I'm trying to get them to do is to take those riskier choices and then discover that they have this ability. Now, now it's really up to them. Are you willing to work as hard as you're going to need to to make this be a part of your everyday function? But I need to show them that capability. So you've talked about movement analysis and, and I wanna hear what that means for you and then tell me how you've integrated that into educating first year students. So um, I watch people move, and I'm always looking for what are they doing in their movement that may be predisposing them to move with some abnormality. And often it's a choice, a compensation. What are they doing in their movement? That's what I'm looking for. Um, and what we've done is, in a sense, Chris and I, Chris Powers and I, we sort of take a diagnosis and put it to the side a little bit. Don't worry about the diagnosis. Let's just look at how they're moving and compare that with, you know, a template of what ideal is. Now, there's variability in movement. We know that. And so it's hard to imagine that every task has a normal, a normal movement. But Every task, there are some invariant features, and, and we're trying to teach the students to just pick out those, or to know those invariant features, um, and then compare that, have that template of ideal in their head, and compare that to what they see their patient do. And, you know, so I should come forward on, you know, my trunk should come pull forward on the surface and they're moving to the side. I mean, it's just that comparison. And in that comparison, they see that I've got to change that. And teaching therapists to, to challenge their patients more, to, to think about uh, not allowing their patients to compensate. I'll, I want to mention another video. There's a great video you showed where there's a woman who's trying to put rings on a stick in front of her, right? and rather than extend her arm, which gives her problems, she's leaning her whole body forward. Yeah. And the physical therapist first verbally tells her not to do that, to try and sit up straight, she can't. And then the physical therapist puts her hand on the woman's shoulder just to sort of keep her there. And all of a sudden the woman's arm extends as if she never had a problem. Yeah. You said, you know, you don't think people are, like, it doesn't always happen that dramatically with right. just one touch, but you don't think that's an outlier. And take me through that. So um, I, yeah, that was dramatic. Yeah. I mean, she's doing this, yeah. and then she stays back, and she can extend her elbow. Yeah. And, and generally, after stroke, one of the things that is considered a neuropathological issue is limited elbow extension. Um, and, but a study that was done by Stella Michelson and Mindy Levin that I talked about in 2001, what they did was they had uh, stroke patients reaching and they had them in a trunk restraint condition and trunk unrestrained condition. And so they basically strapped them into the chair and didn't allow forward motion of the trunk. Because if I need to get that object, but I'm not extending my elbow, then the only way to get it is to move my whole body, right, mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. So um, th they strapped people in the chair and every single patient even the most severe ones got more shoulder flexion, elbow extension, every one of them. And those that were less severe got, got more, but they were all, they all showed that. So it says to me that, that there's some ability that's being masked by this choice. I'm just gonna lean forward 
And so, um, and that, you know, unfortunately there are studies like that out there, but I don't think they factor into our curriculum, is doctor of physical therapy curriculums as much as they should because they might be, you know, like I was saying, lower levels of evidence because it's not a multi-site randomized controlled trial. And so we got to kind of move past that and <laughs> think about what our students really need to understand. Well, it's inspirational stuff. And again, congratulations on your lecture. <laughs> Thank you so uh, much. We're doing more videos like this from Next. So I'm Jason Bellamy, and I'll catch you later.